on, right? Okay. <laughs> you all know that there are certain things that our area is known for, right? Fries on salads, gum bands. That view when you come out of the tunnel is spectacular. I love that. Kennywood, pirates losing. And it's been especially brutal lately, hasn't it been? With the pirates these last couple of weeks, it's been, uh, it's been pretty ridiculous what's going on there. Another thing that we are known for is people moving away and then coming back, right? I'm wondering, how many of you have moved away and then moved back, all right? Okay, there's several of you who have done that. How many of you are originally from the Pittsburgh area? Now I'm just kind of curious about some things. All right, that's most of you. How many of you are living within 15 miles of where you grew up? Wow, that is a lot of people that are in that category. How many of you are ones who were not born in Pennsylvania but are now living here? Transplants. All right, that's a much smaller group of people. Um, I'd actually be in that particular group of people. And it's interesting to think about. Thanks for sharing some of those things there. And it looks like most of us, while we perhaps haven't gone real far, that we have had the opportunity to move from one place to another or to move to a city. And when we're moving from one place to another, the places that we choose to go and live are things typically we choose them because of something that that city has to feature. Now, one of those things that might draw you to one particular city that it has to feature is the fact that you have family there. Others of you move to a city because there's not family there, right? Um, could happen. You don't have to raise any hands or admit that right here. One of the features of the thing that might draw you to a city are the particular school districts that are there, the school district that you could move into, that that's appealing to you. You might move to a city because you might be able to buy more house there than you could buy in a different community. You might move to a city because of its proximity to Orem's Donuts. And I totally respect you for that. Absolutely. But oftentimes when we move a place, we're choosing it. Maybe because work called you there might be another reason. But oftentimes the reason that we move there, or we do move to one place versus another, because of what the features are of that place that it has to offer us whatever that might happen to be, and appropriately so and understandably so that we would do that. And today we're actually going to be thinking about the move to a different city. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we all have a move to a city that is ahead of us. And this city is the most amazing to even imagine. It has more features than any other place you could ever imagine living. And this place that we are talking about, we read of in the scriptures that have already been read for you, whatever service you are in today, it is found there for us in Revelation chapter 21 and a bit of 22. So if you haven't already turned there, please go ahead and do so. And while you do, welcome everybody, those of you who are here in the room, those of you who are watching in other places online or in the classic service or on the moon campus, we're glad that you are checking in with this as well. There's never been a city like the one that we're going to be describing and talking about here today. We've been studying our way through the book of Revelation, and we're coming right down to the very, very end. And here at the end, it talks about a place that we typically just standard refer to as heaven, but it would be more appropriately referred to as the new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth. It's a very precise description. We saw it last week, and we talked about it, and we talked about it kind of in a general sense in the first part of Revelation 21, and it gets a lot more specific here in the things that we are going to be talking about today and what it looks like and what we find there and those sorts of things. Revelation 21, we're going to be talking about the new city because the text talks about a city actually coming down onto this new earth that is being created. The new city is what we are going to be talking about here today, and it's got a name. This new city is called the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. And it's amazing to see what it's going to be like, and when you do, you would think that there couldn't ever be anything better, and that is true, and you would think there is never any occasion when everyone wouldn't just flock to be a part of this city, but that's not the case. In fact, there are many people who are not choosing this city and so that's actually where I want to begin talking because the text begins there about some city choices. City choices. 
is where we're starting. This section of text begins in a very interesting way. I just want to show you this. There's some, some contrast here that's interesting to look at. So verse 9 begins, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me. And if that sounds familiar to you, you've been paying really, really good attention. Because back in chapter 17, different context, back in chapter 17 and verse 1, John wrote there, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me. That sounds very, very similar to what we find here beginning in verse 9. Then verse 9 continues, the second half of the verse. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Back in chapter 17, second half of verse 1 says, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. It sounds very similar, even though it's dealing with different subjects. Very similar. There's something intentional that's going on here. In our next verse, 21 verse 10, we read, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain. Chapter 17 verse 3, And he carried me away in the Spirit into a wilderness. 22 verse 8, back in our context, John is in awe of what the angel is showing him, and he says, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me, but he said to me, You must not do that. Back in the previous context, chapter 19, verse 10, John says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. These are two distinct visions, two very distinct separate visions that John is recording here, but there's a lot of similarity. This is something called parallelism. Parallelism is what's happening here. These visions are being brought together in structure to highlight how different they are in substance. And it's almost the contrast that highlights that because it's like same, same, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same, different. And it's like it just jumps off the page. And that's the contrast that is being set up here. And the contrast is between Babylon, that great harlot, the prostitute that we have talked about that signifies all things that are evil, all things that are sinful, all things that are working opposed to God and opposed to God's purposes, set on the one side over against the bride of Christ that is coming down as a part of the city onto the new earth, in this new city, the new Jerusalem. And it's highlighting the distinction, the the difference between these two very different things. And ultimately, what is being said here, what Jesus is showing John, and John is recording for us, is that the coming kingdom of Christ is the absolute antithesis to the kingdom of this world. That's what's being pointed out for us here. And the city, because there's the different cities, there's a choice that needs to be made. And you're gonna, are you going to live for the city of man, Babylon, and those things that feed your own self-interest, those things that just go after gratifying your own sinful nature? Or are you going to live for the city of God, this new city where righteousness reigns? It's a decision that is being made day by day by day by people all around us, by people in our families, by people at our workplaces, by people who live near us, in our neighborhoods, and it's vital that we would understand this, that we might understand the urgency, the distinction between them, so that we might be engaged in seeing to it that others would come to understand and would come to know, or that we ourselves, if we are not yet in that position, would come to make the right choice. You can't have one foot in one and one in the other. This is about being all in here that he's talking about. It's all or nothing, and the city that you choose demonstrates the true nature of what is going on in your heart. So it's a way for us to do this evaluation. What is your longing for the city that ultimately is to come? So this vision highlights that choice. And the ultimate purpose here really isn't to revisit Babylon. It's not my purpose. It's not actually the purpose of the text. It doesn't go back and talk yet again about Babylon. It seems every chapter it comes up again and again and again. That's really not what this is about. But it does bring up this highlight in the way that John is writing this. So in the mind of the reader, in the mind of the hearer, that we recognize there is this distinction. And there's something far better to be received. Something far better to be experienced. And that's what he goes on to describe for us as the text continues. And as he does so, we see some city features of this new city. Some city features. You know, every city loves to boast about the features of that city, right? Paris, what do they have? They've got the Eiffel Tower. And if you were watching any of the Olympics, it was like central to almost everything that they said. The Eiffel Tower in Paris or in London, it's Big Ben. The clock tower, not, you know, the former athlete, right? Or in Pittsburgh, the bridges are highlighted. Or in 
wampum. It's the Dollar General. I mean, it's different in every city, of course, but uh, you, you boast what you've got to boast about. In this city here, there's a lot to boast about as we take a look at what it has to say, the features of this new city, the new Jerusalem that John saw. And the first thing has to do with pearly gates. You hear that all the time, don't you, when it's talking about heaven? It talks about the pearly gates. Let's pick it up in verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for God, from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the, e- on the west, three gates. Jumping down to verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. The text says these gates are part of a huge, tall wall, which means that the gates themselves would have to be enormous. Enormous. Probably hundreds of feet tall. And it says it's made out of a single pearl. Just think of that, a single. How big would that oyster have to be? right? To have 100-foot-tall pearl. Now, whether or not God uses an actual oyster to create this pearl, or whether it's something that he does in another way, it's going to be very, very impressive. And it's not just the size of the gates, it's the number of them, and it's what's written on these gates that is just as important. There are 12 gates, and inscribed on them are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Abraham. Abraham was the father of a nation, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. So great, you aren't even going to be able to count all the people who are a part of it. And eventually he uses his offspring. And through Jacob, who was later named Israel, there are 12 tribes, 12 sons. And each of those sons, the head of a tribe. And God promises that these are going to be his people. And he was going to be their God. And ultimately, through the old covenant promise, we see these people, Israel, become the promised nation God's chosen people. And here we see them because we see the names of the heads of these tribes there on these gates. We see that who has come in through these gates are the nation of Israel. We see that God is fulfilling his promise and part of those who inhabit this, this ultimate new city are those he has made this promise to through the old covenant, through the offspring of Abraham, through the tribes of Jacob, of Israel. It's also significant that there are gates on each side of the city, an even number of gates on each side of the city, three on the east and three on the south and three on the north and three on the west, it says, which is symbolizing for us, I do believe, that there are people who are going to come and enter into the city from all different directions. We've talked many times before about how the celebration that is going to be happening in the new heaven and then the new earth and the new Jerusalem and this new city, how it is going to be multicultural, how it's going to have people from every language and tribe and nation and people worshiping together there around the throne. And they're coming, they're flooding from all different corners of the earth to come and inhabit this. And that's the work that God is doing. And it's awesome. It's spectacular to see. These pearly gates are an amazing feature, this new city that we'll inhabit one day. There's another one, another city feature we read about here, and it's of the brilliant foundations. The brilliant foundations, we read about the foundations of this wall that surrounds the city in verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. Then it goes on to list the jewels. It talks about jasper, and it talks about sapphire, and agate, and emerald, and so on. Twelve of them in all, having the names of the twelve apostles that are written on them, which should ring some bells for you because of what we've just talked about. Twelve gates, twelve tribes of Israel, old covenant. What do you think this has to do with? Well, naturally, it has to do with the apostles. It has to do with the new covenant, the new covenant that God established through the gospel as it goes out through the apostles. And people are brought into fellowship. Yes, the Jews still, but now the attention is being turned to the Gentiles, the rest of the world, other nations and languages and tribes and tongues who are also being reached with the gospel. And they too are now coming in 
to this city. They also will inhabit this city. It's simply indicating the fact that God is going to dwell with his people, all sorts of people from all over, signified by those who've come in through the chosen people of God in the Old Covenant and those in the New Covenant through the work of the apostles as well. It's a beautiful thing. This city is the culmination of the redemptive purposes of God through all history. That's who's coming in. And that's the significance of these gates and the significance of this foundation. It's what the patriarchs were longing for. Hebrews tells us that Abraham and his offspring were looking forward to the city, to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That's what the apostles gave their lives for. And it's our hope as well. If you're in Christ, my friend, you are going to see those gates. You're going to walk through those gates. Think about it. You're going to see those foundations in all of its beautiful color. Yes, it's, it's just those things that we think are so precious and that we pay so much money for. It's building material in heaven. But it's awesome. And it's going to be beautiful. And you are going to love it. This is our inheritance. Then there's a third feature here as well. And that's the expansive dimensions. John is careful to tell us something of the dimensions of the city. And we find it starting in verse 15. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. Earlier we read that the streets of gold were pure, transparent glass. Here it says the city itself is gold, pure, and transparent. Now, I'm sure that all of you have seen gold, and I'm sure that all of you have seen glass, but none of you have ever seen transparent gold. You haven't, because it's not a human element. And all the way along, we've seen that John at times has struggled to be able to tell us exactly what this new heaven, this new earth, what this city, this new Jerusalem is all about. And so many different times, because of the, the limits of human language relative to what heaven is going to be, he's had to say, well, it's going to be a lot like this, or it looked like that, using the things that he did know, that his audience, his readers would know. And it's spectacular just in the way it's described alone, but my sense of it is that there's going to be something beyond what we've ever seen before, because he can't even describe it. He says, it's like this. It's like that. And he's falling short because of the limitations of human language to be able to tell us all the magnificence that no doubt is going to reflect the glory of God in ways that human language cannot describe. Looking forward to that. The description of the size of the city is also arresting. He says it's, says it's 12,000 stadia square. 12,000 stadia, you're wondering how big that is. It's about 1,500 miles Think of the size of that, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide. To give you a sense of that, 1,500 miles, 1,500 mile box or square would be like from Pittsburgh to Denver and Denver south to Mexico City and Mexico City south or east over to south of Cuba and then back up to Pitt. That's how vast, that's how big this is talking about. That long, that wide. But do you know the, uh, notice the other dimension? It's also that high. It says it's that high as well as what the text is telling us here about this. And when these original hearers would have heard that, I believe that their minds would have gone immediately to 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 20. Here's what that says. It's talking about the building of the original temple. It says the inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold. What's that shape? It's a cube. Equal distant, wide, long, and high. This inner sanctuary that it's talking about there is talking about what we typically refer to as the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, as many of you know, is that place in the center of the temple. It is a place where a representative of mankind met with God, but just once a year would go to meet with God. And it was separated from the rest of the courtyards with a curtain, a huge curtain covering the whole thing that would separate man from 
God, as it were. And the reason was because man in his sinfulness couldn't have fellowship and dwell together directly with God. It would just, it would destroy him. Couldn't happen. So there's this barrier, this curtain, and only the high priest could go in and only once a year. And of course, Jesus came into our world. Jesus took that sin, mankind's sin, on himself. And when Jesus dies, what happens to the curtain? It's torn in two. It splits from top to bottom. God is tearing it from the top down to the bottom. What is it doing? It is signifying now that the way is made open for all mankind because of the work of Jesus taking our sin out of the way. There is now access for all of us directly to God. That is the point about what is being spoken of when Jesus dies there. So now we see the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and we find it, just like the Holy Holy of Holies, is a perfect cube. It is the same length and width and height as well. It's pretty incredible to stop and think about. It's a clear picture for us of this new city where God is going to be and where people are going to have direct access to God. It's pretty spectacular to think about. There's no curtain. There's no intermediary that is necessary. And the gates of the wall, verse 25 tells us here, the gates stay open continually just again signifying the fact that we have free and ready access to God all the time, not once a year, all the time. That's why this new city will not have a need for the temple, verse 22 says, to meet with God, because the whole city is a temple, because God is present there, and we're present with Him. We don't have to go to a place. We don't have to bring a sacrifice. It's a beautiful thing to contemplate. Leads to another truth about the new city has to do with some final city realities. There's some things that the text goes on to highlight that are going to be true about this city. And the first of those is that there will be no more night. No more night. Look at verse 23. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And jump into chapter 22, verse 5. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now, it is possible that there will not be any actual sun or moon in this new heaven and in this new earth, though the text says there's no need for it, technically, a couple of different places. It doesn't say there won't be any but it's possible either way. Certainly the glory of Jesus would be sufficient to illuminate it. It's clear that John here is also carrying forward an idea that he brings up back in his gospel, same John with the gospel of John. There he talks a lot about light versus darkness, light versus darkness, and darkness in that context is always talking about sin. It's talking about evil. It's talking about all things that are opposed to God, opposed to his will, opposed to his purposes. And there's no doubt that this city is absent of all those things. It's, we just read it. It said nothing unclean will ever enter it. That certainly includes sin, but it also includes the effects of sin. It includes the effects of brokenness that brings other things into our lives today, like disease and pain and anxiety and fear and loneliness and heartbreak of any sort. The new city is free of all of that because there's no more night. There's no, it's not just there's no more darkness. It's that there is no more sin. There is no more evil. All of that is gone. All of that has been judged and done away with. And we've, we've read of that in previous weeks. Another new city reality is that there will be the tree of life. This takes us into chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. Each month. 
The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Tree of Life takes us all the way back, of course, to the very first book of the Bible. Takes us back to Genesis, where we find the Garden of Eden, and we find central there in the Garden of Eden is this tree of life. It is the same tree of life, and Adam and Eve were given specific instructions about that, and they, they disobeyed those instructions, and they ate of it, and, and all of a sudden now the way to that tree is blocked. But in the new city, the way is going to be made open again, the way that God intended it from the very beginning. And the blessing is expanded beyond that. We find also here there is this pure river of the water of life running down Main Street, flowing from the throne of God. Apparently, it must be, must be somehow cutting through in the tree of life that is present there. It talks about it in, as a singular tree of life, but yet we see that it's on, on both sides somehow of the river. Maybe it's manifest in, in multiple forms or maybe as 12 different trees or in some other fashion that we can't just figure out from ourselves. But it says that it looks like it's flanked there. And we see its abundance because it produces its fruit all year long with 12 different kinds of fruit. That's pretty incredible. I've told you before about my apple tree that I have at home that seems like it produces fruit all year long because I think that this tree has thousands and thousands of apples that it produces every single year. And I'm not even really making that up. It is that productive of a tree. And so I've tried to spray it. I've listened to everybody's advice to try to get good edible fruit to eat off this tree, but it's never fruit that turns out. It just ends up falling on the ground, and, and I just have to pick it up one apple at a time so that I don't mow over and it shoots these apples as projectiles out into the street to knock little children off their bicycles passing by. I mean, it's horrible to have to pick all of these things up constantly through the season. I should cut it down. I've promised many times that I'm cutting it down. And there's someone sitting here listening right now who has a chainsaw in my neighborhood. And um, maybe we should do that sometime soon. But the tree of life has perfect fruit and symbolizes the perfect provision of God and all who are his. That's what this idea is about. That God is providing for his people. And not just a little bit. It's not like, well, when the season comes, God's going to provide. He's providing all year long, 12 different kinds of fruit, all month, every month. It's the extent of the purpose and the provision of God. And one final city reality is that we will live belonging to the Lamb. Verse 4 brings us home to us. It says, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Last week we saw this same idea that we're able to spend all of eternity, this perfect place with pure righteousness ruling the day in these new bodies that have been glorified, able to just stand and stay in God's presence all the time, looking directly into his face, something Peter and James and John couldn't do at the transfiguration, something that Moses wasn't able to do, will be able to do, looking straight into the face of God for all eternity, day by day by day, sharing perfect fellowship with him, and will belong to him, and he will call us his own. It says here that that The name is written right here on our foreheads. It just says we belong to him. Whether it's literal, whether it's not literal, really doesn't matter. It's just saying we belong to him. It's a beautiful thing to consider. The one who created our world, who died for your sins. Think of that one that we think of and we worship and we celebrate, who has given us such joy and given us such anticipation. The one who died and rose again victorious. The one who is coming back again is calling us his own, and he is ours. Face to face. All eternity. Beyond imagination. Many, many years ago, Jesus ascended from earth into heaven. And he said, as a promise to the disciples, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. This is what he's been working on for all those years, preparing it for you and preparing it for me to one day inhabit for all eternity. Just imagine it. Just imagine it. 
even with the limitations of the language that John has his at his disposal to describe it, it looks incredible. But there's every expectation that it's going to be even better than that. So friends, don't get your cities mixed up. Don't get your cities mixed up. Don't fall into the trap, into the allure of the pull of Babylon that looks so alluring, that looks so desirable. It's promising so much, but it delivers nothing other than pain and death. Don't get sucked into that city. Instead, live in such a way that reveals that the new city, this new city, is your home and rejoice in the glory of it all. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the promise that you give us, the promise of this new city coming down from heaven above onto this new physical place that you're creating for us. It is beyond, it is different from what our concepts often are of this disembodied, ethereal sort of experience somewhere where we're just constantly playing our harps and singing our songs. But something that is rich and full, a city, and could very well anticipate that the things that we think of as being present in a city are present in the city to come with activity and maybe entertainment and sporting and who knows, Lord, you don't tell us that. We speculate. We love to speculate. But what you have told us is it's a place where there's no more night, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more, no more crying. A place where we have ready and constant access to you. A place where the gates are never shut. They don't need to be. There's no enemy. We can come and go freely as we please and be in your presence. Father, help us to not confuse the cities, even though it can be confusing in this life. And we thank you for the promise that is in this text, that for all whose names are written in that book of life, that our anticipation, our confidence can be that we, we will be in your presence. We will be in your home. We thank you for that book. We thank you for lives that can be transformed to write down our names, written down for all of glory, to celebrate, to rejoice in. Father, we look forward to that day. And for anyone who may be here who is, does not have the confidence of that being your future, then think about the city that you're pursuing. Confess your sin. Ask for God's forgiveness. Ask him to come be your Lord and Savior through your faith and trust in him. And God will write your name in that book, a new name written down, glory. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, for your blessing as we celebrate it together. We look forward to inhabiting that city, worshiping you for all days. As we continue to do, even now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.